This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, I know that it is Christmas season, and next week there will be a a special message because of that. But this morning, I have a message that the Lord laid on my heart last Monday when I began praying about the message for today. It's not a Christmas message per se, but I do believe it's what God has for us today. Would you turn in your Bibles this morning to Psalm 127? Psalm 127. We're only going to read one verse this morning for our text, but it is a, it's a verse that carries a, a huge message in one small verse. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as we read our text this morning. I'm going to read only verse 1, Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house... They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is said that this is a song that was written by King Solomon himself. For those of you that may not be familiar with the story, it was King David who had it in his heart to build a house of worship for God. Before this, there was no permanent temple that had ever been built in Israel. They were still using that portable tabernacle that they had built when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. But God refused to allow King David to be the one to build the house because, as God said, David was a man of war with blood on his hands. But instead, God allowed David to gather the materials to build that first temple. And it was his son Solomon that was allowed to actually oversee the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. It must have been a beautiful sight. There were dignitaries from kingdoms all over the known world at the time that came from as far away as Africa to visit and to see the beauty of this building and to meet King Solomon with all of his wisdom face-to-face in person. There were emissaries from Babylon who saw the beauty of the physical structure of the temple and went back and reported to the kings of Babylon all the wealth and the opulence that had gone into making it such a beautiful building. Of course, that's one of the reasons that the Babylonians ended up coming back years later and besieging the city of Jerusalem to take that gold and silver and the precious, beautiful things from that temple back to Babylon. But what King Solomon says in this psalm, this one verse, is of such great importance not only to those involved in the building of that first temple, but to any church that wants to build a work for God. As a church, and then also to you and I as individual Christians, if we want to build a life that's pleasing to God, look again at that verse before I pray, if you would. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians and a lot of churches that are going about to build something for God, but God is not in it. I'd like to bring you a message this morning with God's help entitled, Build the House. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that for the next few minutes, you would help us to be focused on what you would desire for us as a church to be and to do. Dear God, not unlike the Israelites of old, we desire to build a house and a work to the glory of your name. Father, I pray that we would not do as many have done before us and are doing today to build something that's beautiful on the outside but not on the inside. 
But dear God, I pray that it would be a house that gets glory for you, both as a church and in our families and in our own individual lives. I pray you'd use this message for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. And you may be seated. The year 2020, as Miss Julie alluded to in her testimony before the special this morning, has been a year. It has been a different year, unlike any that I think I've ever seen in my life and probably anything unlike you've ever seen in your life. Even the older folks that I've spoken to who uh, hearken back to years not too far removed from the Great Depression say 2020 has been a year that has changed people's lives, not necessarily for the good in many respects more than anything we've ever seen before. We do not know what 2021 holds. We all, as Julie uh, said in her words this morning, hope that it's better than the year that's about to depart from us. But in 2020, we have seen many things happen right here in America and right here in Georgia and right here in Griffin and Locust Grove, McDonough, Covington, Thomaston, from wherever you might be. There are things going on all around us that are unprecedented, that are attempts to stop the work of God from going on. Who would have ever thought a year ago that in our lifetime we would ever hear decrees from government officials that you can't hold church service in your church? And yet it's gone on all across America. This is the land of the free. And yet there have been many instances across America where churches have been told, you can't hold service. If you do, the church will be fine. The preacher might be taken off to jail or any host of other situations that could happen. Even in places where churches weren't told they couldn't have services. There are a lot of people that for health reasons are staying at home today. They're not getting out and going anywhere. There are also a lot of instances I'm afraid and ashamed to say, even in our own church as well as other good Bible-believing churches, where there are people that could be in church, but they're not. You know, I went to... Uh, T.R. and I stopped when we were on the way to Brother John's internment service over in Alabama several months ago. We stopped at a Zaxby's right across the uh, state line in Alabama. And uh, it seems that Zaxby's, just like so many other places, is using the quote-unquote pandemic as an excuse for doing less and and charging more. They're offering less service and less product while charging their customers more. We stopped there and uh, TR ordered his uh, chicken fingers like he always does uh, with the Zaxby sauce. And the preacher ordered, believe it or not, a salad. And uh, I love the Zaxby salads. I don't like salads just anywhere, but theirs is pretty good. Well, I was expecting this big yellow bowl that they always fill to the brim with salad to come out. Instead, they brought me this little to-go I don't know that I would, I don't really know that I'd call it a bowl. It was only about an inch and a half deep, so I'm not sure that that uh, actually qualifies as a bowl. It was much smaller in circumference than those big yellow bowls, and it was only, like I say, about an inch to an inch and a half thick. Well, I took the lid off it. We were actually eating in the restaurant, but they said because of the pandemic, We're serving everyone, even the dining customers, in the to-go containers. So we sat down there at the booth, and I opened it up, took the lid off, and pressed my fork down in to get a bite of salad. And lo and behold, what I discovered is there was a false bottom in that bowl. And so what I thought was an inch and a half thick was maybe an inch thick at the best. And there was just enough lettuce and other things in there so that you couldn't see uh, the bottom of this, uh, the false bottom of this plastic bowl they were serving in the salad. 
Now, the price they charged was the same price I've always paid for a Zaxby salad as far as I can remember going back, but it was maybe a third or a fourth of the amount of food that you normally get in those big yellow bowls when you get a Zaxby salad. It's just one example of many that I could give, and you could probably give others, where people are offering less service and less product and using the excuse of the virus and charging the same price. I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians, though, in 2020 that have used the pandemic, the virus situation, if you would, as an excuse to stop doing a lot of things that they ought to be doing. And one of those things is being faithful to the house of God and being faithful in their personal worship of God. Not just at church, but at home too. People have gotten, for several months, used to just sitting at home, not going anywhere, not doing anything, and they have taken up some very bad habits, I'm afraid. But those habits have spilled over not only into their daily routine as far as not getting any exercise, not necessarily doing anything productive, but it has also affected many Christians in their spiritual lives, I'm afraid. But as we look forward to this coming year, I think that all of us ought to be challenged from the story that's recorded in the book of Ezra, in the Old Testament, where they built or I should say rebuilt, the temple in Jerusalem. For after that original temple in all its beauty and all its splendor had been built and admired by the people of God and the world around them, the Babylonians came in, as I said before, took it apart piece by piece, looking for all the hidden gold and silver in the construction of that beautiful, beautiful temple. But finally, after 70 years of captivity, just as God had promised through the prophet Jeremiah before they ever went into captivity, they were allowed to return to the land and to rebuild the house of worship, to rebuild the house of God that had not stood for 70 years. And to be quite honest, most of those that returned to the city and were allowed to rebuild the temple of God had never even seen the original temple. It was 70 years before that that it was destroyed. Most of them were not 70 years old. They had been born in captivity in another land and had never even seen the original temple. Would you take your Bibles and turn in the Old Testament with me to the book of Ezra chapter number 3. The rest of our time this morning will be spent in the book of Ezra. Ezra is, uh, he is a scribe who was uh, a, an employee working in the court of the king of Persia who allowed the children of Israel to return to the land and to rebuild the house of God. It is the story of rebuilding the temple that is recorded in the book of Ezra. We're not going to read all the book of Ezra this morning, but we will see exactly what took place as they were attempting to rebuild the house of God. Because I submit to you this morning that the things that happened during their attempt to build a house for God are the very same things we're up against today. There are those who want to stop the church of the living God from even meeting. When I say the church of the living God, I'm talking about local New Testament, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches. There are governors and those that are higher and lower on the totem pole who want to see the doors of every Bible-believing church shuttered and no one allowed to go in there. And I want to tell you that's not over. So if you think that that's going to end with 2020, it's not going to end. There are those who are going to continue to push for one reason or another to close the doors of churches. But so too is that same opposition to you doing anything for God in your personal life. 
we might be able to see and hear those things on the news about closing the doors of churches as far as the physical buildings go, but you can mark it down. If there's a desire to close the physical doors of the church, there's even a greater desire to close your personal worship of God, to change your life, and to turn you as a Christian in just another one of these automatons walking up and down the highways and the byways, living their lives, doing what they're told to do without ever reverencing the God of this book. It's not going to change. That's not going to go away. So rather what needs to happen is Christians and churches need to decide now that whatever comes in 2021 and thereafter, we are not going to stop serving our God. and That we're going to initiate a closer walk with Him than we've ever had before. Look, if you would, at Ezra chapter number 3. I hope you're there already. I won't read all the verses, but look with me, if you would, at verses 10 through 13. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It was a great day, in other words. They rejoiced. They were seeing with their very own eyes the foundation being laid. If the foundation's not there, you can't build a structure on top of it. They witnessed the laying of the foundation. It's no different than when you've uh, heard of churches starting a building, uh, a building of a new sanctuary, and they hold a big service, and everybody goes outside, and uh, one of the deacons or the preacher or somebody takes a shovel, sticks that first shovel of uh, down in the ground, picks up that first shovel of dirt, and throws it over to the side to begin laying the foundation for a new building of worship. When they saw, those that were involved in the building saw the foundation, that the foundation was laid, and now they were ready to get to work. Building on the new temple, look at verse 12 though. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that's another way of saying they were older fellows, that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. And many shouted also aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. There were two things that were going on that day when they laid the foundation for this second temple in Jerusalem. Most of the people that were there were shouting for joy. They were singing, playing cymbals, and shouting with joy of thanksgiving to God because they were excited about what God was about to do in rebuilding the house of the Lord. But those that were older, those who had been around 70 years before and had been old enough to see the original temple with their own eyes before it was destroyed and before they were all led away into a foreign land into captivity, instead of shouting for joy, all they could do was weep. Why were they weeping? They were weeping because they remembered what had been. And now was gone. Dear friends, I submit to you, let us not, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, or 50 years from now, let us not that are here this morning be like those ancient men who said, I remember what it was. I remember what was in the days of old. There's no way it could ever be the same again. 
And I'm going to be honest with you, the temple that they rebuilt, it's called Jerubbabel's temple. But Jerubbabel's temple was never anything compared to the magnificence of Solomon's temple. The original one that had been built. There was good reason for those older men to weep. I think maybe they were weeping with joy perhaps that the house of God was being rebuilt. But I think too they were weeping because... The foundation that was laid for this new temple was nothing to compare to what had been there before. If you and I are not careful, 20, 30, or 50 years from now, you and I will look back on this time in our lives, in the history of our church and our country, and we will weep because of what was and is not. Dear friends, you and I must purpose in our hearts now that the things God has started in this place, in this church, and in your life, and in your family are not going to stop. That no matter what comes in 2021 and beyond, we are not going to stop serving our God. They laid a foundation. Foundations are important. Without a foundation, you can't build a building that's going to last any amount of time, especially not when the storms of life come along. They laid the foundation. In a church, you want to lay a foundation deep and wide. It's kind of like that old children's church song that the kids like singing at vacation Bible school. Deep and wide. Deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. That's talking about the blood of Christ that can wash away anyone's sins. But as a pastor, I want you to know that I try to help us as a church lay a foundation at Pinnacle Baptist Church that's both deep and wide. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, wide in that we'd like to have more of us here than we have here. We'd like to see people coming through the door every single week that are new, that have never been here before. We want to see the church grow in numbers. And by the way, we could do that very easily by doing the same kinds of things that some of these contemporary style churches are doing that'll get people here just to be entertained. But just entertaining people is not our purpose for existing as a church. That's not the purpose of the church at all. We want to grow wide. We want to increase in numbers of those of us that are here. Let's face it, wouldn't all of you like to see uh, the sanctuary pews so full that the choir has to stay up in the choir loft one Sunday morning? Brother John, wouldn't you like to see that? Brother Alex? I think we'd all like to see that. But we also need to be building a foundation that's deep. You and I that are here, we need to understand the Word of God. We need to actively work to learn the Word of God. It's not just the preacher's job to know what this book says. It's all of our responsibility. It's your responsibility to make sure the pastor's preaching what it says. We all ought to be grounded firmly in the Word of God. But if you don't know the Word of God, how can you be grounded in it? We ought to be laying a foundation here that's deep and wide. Without a foundation, there won't be much of a house. But as soon as they started building, guess what happened? The ites came out, the termites, you might say. They're not called termites in the story, but they're every kind of that there was around there. The Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, and all the other ites that lived in the land. Their descendants. Why? Because they wanted to stop the work of God from going on. Look at Ezra chapter 4. The very next chapter, look at the first three verses. Look and listen to what the people of the land said to the children of Israel who were building the house for the Lord. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to 
Zerubbabel, and to the chief of the fathers, and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asher Haddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. Notice what these people that are not Israelites said to the Jews. They said, let us build with you, for we seek your God as we do. I want to tell you that if we're going to build a work for God in this place at Pinnacle Baptist Church, or if you're going to build a work for God in your family under your roof at home, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be opposition from without and opposition from within. Here is the first instance of opposition they encountered from without. From those that were not among them wanting to stop the work. There's a reason these people that came to talk to them are called adversaries in verse 1. An adversary is your opponent. It's not someone that's on the same side that you're on. And their adversaries came to them pretending to be something they were not. They said, we're here to work with you. Let us work together. Friends, I'll tell you right now, if you're willing to work with the other side, the other side will be willing to work with you. You say, preacher, that sounds like a good thing. That sounds like what they talk about up in the halls of Congress. That sounds like compromise together with each other. Can I tell you, no matter what Washington says is good about the word compromise, it's never good when the people of God compromise to work with the world. You want some examples of compromising to work with the world? Go to the church down the street that had a rock concert this morning with the drums playing, the steel guitars and all that stuff and the music that sounded just the same as the music those musicians were playing the night before in the dance club down the road. Or the same music that the people sitting in the pews were listening to when they went to the dance club or the nightclub. The night before. The music sounds the same. Maybe the words appear to have Christian words, but the music's the same. And there's a big crowd there this morning, but they've compromised with the world because they want to draw a big crowd. You've heard this preacher talk about it before, so I'm not saying anything new you haven't heard me say before. But that's just one example of compromise with the world. How about all the churches who have members who don't like what's in that book? I mean, let's be honest with you. There are some things in that book that offend some people. The homosexual crowd doesn't like that book. Because if you believe this book exactly the way it's written, anybody that's a homosexual is in rebellion to God. And there's no other way around it. Doesn't matter what the teacher at school says. Doesn't matter what the, uh, the judge says that's wearing the black robe in the courtroom. And it doesn't matter what the preacher says who gets up and says, that's okay with God. It ain't okay with God. But there are churches willing to compromise. It was a sad, sad day earlier this past year when I read that there's now become a split uh, even in the United Methodist denomination, over whether or not to allow homosexuals to be ordained pastors in the Methodist church. Brother John, I'm positive that when you were a boy growing up, nobody would have ever thought that day would come. You say, well, that's the Methodist. That's not the Baptist church. Oh, it's coming. You can mark it down. Every, de every mainline denomination in America is headed down the same road. As a boy growing up, I never would have imagined Southern Baptist churches would be giving missions money to missionaries who claim that they speak in tongues like the charismatic crowd does. And yet, just about three or four years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention gave their approval to supporting missionaries with Southern Baptist money, even though those missionaries say they believe in speaking in tongues like the charismatic churches do. Compromise. 
compromise. Why? Because we want this big tent and we want everybody to be able to come in the big tent and believe whatever they want to believe, do whatever they want to do, live however they want to live. It doesn't matter what the Bible says anymore. Folks, that's compromise. It's the world coming into the church instead of the church going out to the world. And folks, that's going to destroy the church just like it destroyed Israel before the first temple was ever ripped down. But that's what the enemies of God's people do. They don't say, we don't want you to be there at all, at least not at first. Even though that's what they want, what they'll say is, let's just work together. Let's just hold hands together. Let us work with you. But you can mark it down. It always results in God's people changing from where they stand Today and tomorrow, it won't be the same. When the day comes one day that this pastor isn't the pastor here anymore, I hope it's many years down the road. But when that day comes, this church ought to be well grounded enough in the Word of God that you're not going to fall for something new that comes down the road. It's not going to happen while this preacher's here unless you get rid of me. But if the Lord tarries is coming. I hope there's a day that me and Brother John are both out back. The question is whether this church will be grounded enough in the Word of God that we won't compromise, that this church will continue on and not have to be rebuilt in a lesser way, lesser glory than what it once was. I've heard preachers that were older get up and say this before when I was younger, and I think it's true. Everything I've seen in my life bears it out to be true. I've heard preachers say that the first generation of Christians in a new church, boy, they've got a real zeal for God. The pioneer spirit, they want to do a work for God. I, I believe that's here at Pinnacle Baptist Church. I believe it's been here the whole six years. We've been in existence since we started the church in your grandma and grandpa's kitchen, Alex. And I believe there's a desire among the people that are here to do something for God. Not to compromise, but to be the right kind of church. By the way, there have been people that have come that are not here anymore. You know why? It's because this wasn't, well, they decided they wanted to do something different than what we're doing here. But that pioneer spirit, after those who get started in the first beginning stages of a church, after they're gone and buried out back or somewhere else, the next generation of members in the church come along, and well, they weren't involved in building the church. They took for granted there was a nice building, and the air was always on, and there was carpet on the floors, and it was just a comfortable place to come, and they didn't have to sacrifice anything to make the church what it was. They just grew up taking it for granted. Assuming it would always be there and would always be the same. Rarely ever does a church continue in the same spirit as that first generation who built a work for God because the second generation will take it for granted. Everybody that's here this morning is in on the ground floor of building Pinnacle Baptist Church. We ought to have that missionary spirit, that pioneer spirit, and wanting to do something for God in this place. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, what's going to be left of those that come behind us? How many churches, 20 years from now, do you think there will be right here in Griffin, Georgia, that will still be preaching the gospel without any reservation unashamedly, instead of watering it down. How many churches today are there that are doing that here in Griffin? I think there are a few, and they're not all independent Baptists, by the way. But 20 years from now, with the way things are going, how many churches do you think there will be that will still be holding to this book? How many of them do you think will even still be preaching out of a King James Bible 20 years from now? There aren't too many of those already. 
And the further you get away from this book, the more likely it is that you accept a whole bunch of other compromises too. You can say what you want to about independent Baptist preachers because we independent Baptist pastors have plenty of problems. But the one thing I'll say about independent Baptist preachers is they hold tenaciously as a general rule to that book. Twenty years from now, though, I wonder how many churches there will be still trying to be a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Look at all the churches that are letting the world in right now. Let us build together. That's what the world says. Do you think that the lost crowd really wants to build a church to the same God that you and I want to build a church to? No. Else they'd already be saved. They want to be rebellious. They don't want anyone uh, telling them what to do. And they don't want to feel convicted by somebody else doing right in the neighborhood. So the best thing to do, get inside, undermine things, water it down. Then it'll be just like all the other churches then they don't have to feel guilty because they're not following what this book says to follow. But that's what the world's crowd said. They said, let us work together. Let us build together. In other words, let us compromise. You can believe political compromise is good or not. I don't believe that. You can believe that if you want to. But I assure you, spiritual compromise... Biblical compromise is never good because you're either right or you're wrong. You're either where God says we ought to be or you're not. And if you and I compromise to make somebody else feel good about themselves, to make somebody else more comfortable, we do neither them nor ourselves any good. But that didn't work. The Jews didn't accept that and they said, no, no thank you. We're not interested. Look down in verse number 6 of Ezra chapter 4. Ezra 4 verse 6. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, that's the king of Persia, wrote they, the adversaries, unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. You know what? The world's crowd changed their tactics. They changed their game plan. At first they tried to just fit in and get the the people of God to compromise. When that didn't work though, look what they did. Then they started accusing them. They started accusing them of things that were not true. You can read the rest of the chapter. We don't have time to do that. But they were accusing them of things that were not true. You can mark it down, friend. If you're trying to live for God, you're going to be accused of some things that are not true. You're going to be accused of being a hate mongerer. Hating people. You're going to be accused of being homophobic. I'll just tell you right now, I'm not afraid of homosexuality, but I hate it with a passion because God hates it with a passion. I don't think God hates those people, but He hates the sin in which they're living. He wants them to be saved and to do right. You say, preacher, that's the second time this sermon you've already mentioned that particular sin. Why is it? It's because it is running rampant in our society today. You can't watch one thing on television, one thing at the movie theater, and the kids can't go to government schools today without being told it's okay, it's acceptable, and if you say anything against it, you're a hateful person. If you try to live by the things in this book, you're also going to be called a racist, a xenophobe, and a whole lot of other things because you want our country to live by that book. They're going to come up with a whole host of other names. They're going to accuse you of things that aren't true, just like the enemies of God accused them when they were rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. So if it bothers you, if it hurts your feelings, if it makes you feel, oh no, ashamed and embarrassed, just go ahead and get over it. 
Get over being ashamed or embarrassed when the world calls you a name for standing in this book where you ought to stand. Just go ahead and accept it's going to happen. You say, preacher, nobody's ever called me any of those names. Well, one of two things is true. Either it's going to happen and just hadn't happened yet, or number two, you need to take a stronger stand. One or the other, I don't know which. But it's going to happen. Because the world hates this book because they hate the God of this book. They're in rebellion and want to do their own thing, and they want to weaken and destroy the people of God who bring constant conviction on their lives. They're not going to be too convicted if nobody else is standing on the other side saying it's wrong. They claim that they want to be able to do whatever they want to do and you do whatever you want to do, but that's not really what they want. They want to be able to do whatever they want to do without anybody else saying it's wrong. Why? Because they don't want to feel convicted. That's what they're opposing. They did the same thing with the children of God. Now, I'm going to skip down through a whole lot of the story here because of time's sake this morning. There came a point where the children of Israel, because of these people accusing them of things, the people of God were told to stop building the temple. A new king that didn't issue the original decree was on the, on the scene, and he said, well, I hear all these accusations. Uh, stop. Stop building the temple. And there was a time when the children of God stopped. They weren't doing the work of God anymore. They were letting someone else besides God dictate whether they were going to build the house of God. Now this past year, there were lots of churches in our area that stopped having in-person services. I'm so thankful that even with everything that went on, Pinnacle Baptist Church never canceled a single service because of any virus situation. We held every single service. And as I've told you before, as long as I'm your pastor and you don't get rid of me, we're not going to cancel any services in the future. And when whichever governor, he or her, decides that they're going to order all the churches in Georgia at some point to close their doors either because of this virus or the next one, we're not going to close the doors for that either. You can vote the preacher out or the doors are going to be open. You can come or not come, but the preacher's going to be here and the preacher's going to be preaching. In the last month alone, I've heard from three different preachers in our area who have said putting our services online was the worst thing we ever did for our church. You say, whoa, wait a minute. People weren't going to the in-person services because they were afraid of the virus. Why would the preachers say it was a bad decision to put the services online? They need to hear the preaching. All three of those preachers, and I'm sure there are preachers that have other opinions, but these three preachers said it was the worst thing we ever did for our church because now half of them think it's okay to sit in their pajamas on, on Sunday morning and watch things on the internet and they won't ever be back. I don't know if it's true or not true, but for the preachers to be the ones saying that, something's Something's to it. There's some truth to it. Now we put our services on there, but you don't get to you don't get to stream it live. You can go on and listen next uh, sometime this week to today's sermon, but it's not live. Why? Because if God's people can be in God's house, they ought to be in God's house. There's no replacement for the fellowship, the edification, and the exhortation that comes from being in person in God's house with God's people. I know there are some folks with physical situations that can't be here and shouldn't be here today. I'm not talking about that. But there are a lot of Christians today in churches all around us 
that ought to be in church today, and they're not here. They're not at their church. We have some people today that ought to be here that don't have the health reasons and could be here, should be here, but they're not here. Why? It's because they're just like the people at Zaxby's. They're using the situation in the world as an excuse to do less than they ought to do. What a shame. Friends, let it not be said at Pinnacle Baptist Church that that's the way we are. I want to share one last thing with you, and then I'm going to close the message. Look with me at the same passage, Ezra, but chapter number 5, verse 1. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua the son of Josadak, and began to build the house of God which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. You see, Israel had stopped building the temple because the new king said, stop. But praise God for some rebel prophets. There were some rebel prophets in Israel that said, hey, why are you folks not building? And they said, well, the king said not to build. But look what Haggai said. Look what Zechariah said. They said, you need to go to building. The king isn't the boss. This is God's house, not the king's house. The prophets of God, these rebel prophets, they said, get back to building. And praise God, the people did what they said to do. It says, and began to build the house of God. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. Praise God for the rebel prophets that said, get back to building. Can I stand here and tell you this morning that Christians in America and members of Pentecost Baptist Church need to get back to building. If you've taken a break, if you've taken some time off, I mean spiritually, I mean from doing the work of God, from building a church of the living God, If you've taken some time off or you've become kind of careless in your personal relationship with God, can I tell you, as a rebel prophet, it's time to get back to building. There are a lot of Christians across America that need to get out of the pajamas, put your church clothes back on, go to church on Sunday morning, and start living on Monday morning the things you heard on Sunday morning. And stop using the virus or the government or the election or any other thing as an excuse to not do what we ought to be doing in building the house of God and a work for the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm going to read a couple more verses and I'm done for today. In that same chapter, chapter 5, After the prophets, those rebel prophets, told the people to get back to work, and they got back to work, the king wasn't happy. He said, hey, why are you doing what I told you not to do? Look at their reply in verse number 9. Then asked we those elders and said unto them thus, Who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were the chief of them. In other words, we went and said, who's responsible for you doing this? We told you to stop. Look at the answer, verse 11. And thus they returned us answer saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and build the house that was builded these many years ago, which a great king of Israel built it up and set up. They go on to continue, but look at the first part of verse 11. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. Their accuser said, who are you that you're still building after you were told not to by the king himself? 
We want the names of those that are responsible. Why are you still building? And they said, we're the children of the king. The king of kings and lord of lords. Dear friends, it's time that you and I said that to the rest of this world. We're not serving you. We're serving a God that's greater than everything that's going on in this world. And we're going to get back to work. We're going to get back to building. Can I say like those rebel prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, get to building the house. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would take the message and Lord, use it in the same way you used it in the heart of this preacher this week as I prepared for today. Lord, stir our people's hearts. Lord, make us with a desire to be what you want us to be. Lord, to stop making excuses. Lord, to be more faithful here than we are on the job Monday through Friday. To dedicate ourselves to be what you want us to be. Dear God, I pray you'd make us the kind of church you want Pinnacle Baptist Church to be. Help us in our individual lives to examine our hearts this morning and see if we're right with you. Or maybe if there are some things that we've let slide. We've become a little lazy, and spiritually, we're sitting around in our pajamas right now. Dear God, I pray you'd help us to truly repent if that's the case. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, would you please stand quietly and reverently to your feet? Miss Kim, would you come and prepare to sing an invitational hymn?